Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, the monthly webinar series for Center for Healthy Sex. This is our Sexpert series, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, we have probably well over, I would guess, 100 um, webinars on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in any topic about sex and sexuality, I would direct you to YouTube and type in Center for Healthy Sex, and there you'll feel, find a vast array um, of issues pertaining to all matters of sex and sexuality. We've got some great experts um, that are both informative and amusing. Um, so uh, remember to check that out. I am Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and I'm the Clinical Director of Center for Healthy Sex. And today I'm delighted to talk to you about my new workbook called Sexual Reflections. Um, this book was specifically designed for people in recovery from sex addiction, and it's a workbook uh, for designing and celebrating your sexual health plan. Because ultimately, when you're working with the client, they will be developing a sexual health plan, making the sex addiction model a sex positive model. So I wanna start by telling you a little bit about how this workbook came to fruition. Um, just a tiny bit of history and backstory. Um, those of you who treat sex addiction probably know that Dr. Patrick Carnes put the notion of sex addiction on the map in 1983 with um, his groundbreaking book, uh, Out of the Shadows. And at that time, he was really focused on stopping the destructive um, sexual behaviors that were causing people great pain and shame um, and hurt in their lives. And that was the sort of a narrow band he was studying. And oftentimes researchers are only looking at one thin slice of something. Broad topics are very difficult to sort of wrangle and create any significant information or data about. So he did not have the bandwidth um, to really create a sexual health model. Um, his model initially was an abstinence model, but as anything over time, it's evolved. Um, and clinicians have been evolving it by <clears throat> you know, writing books. I wrote Erotic Intelligence in 2010 um, and talking about healthy sexuality, but we've had no formal sexual health plan until today. So this model, what I call the Katahakis Integrated Sex Therapy Model, came out of my dissertation in which um, I ran a research uh, project. So this workbook encourages clients to reflect on their physical selves their thoughts, their emotions, their personal and sexual values. There's a section on preferred sex acts, uh, certainly dating and relationship concerns, and ultimately spirituality to guide them to an individually tailored understanding of their unique sexuality. And for those of you that are therapists that are listening, um, there are specific directions in the workbook to help you guide your client. So the two of you are working in tandem. Um, so that you are sort of a recovery buddy in that moment, um, asking good, healthy questions um, that help the client start to reflect on whether or not the choices they're making are really true for them or not true for them. If it has them in their integrity and aligned with their personal values or out of their integrity. So this workbook is meant to be done with a trusted other. Um, likewise, or additionally, I should say, it helps the therapist or instructs the therapist on how to track and scale visceral um, and affective activation and systems. So what that means, and I'll explain it later, is that uh, the therapist is going to be noticing the impulses in their own body. And also there's a mechanism for helping the client track what they're feeling in their body. Because oftentimes all of us, whether we're in, uh, you know, recovering from an addiction or not, um, think we know the right answer for ourselves. And the left brain um, overrides, oftentimes overrides, right brain implicit material because of the way it operates. It's logical, it's linguist, uh, linear, it's linguistic. Um, it fires in that logical and linguistic and linear pattern also. So it will grab something that it think it knows and make it fact. And when you start to track what the person's actually really feeling in their body, they may be feeling something very different than what their head is telling them is okay. So we really want to turn to the body um, to find the actual truth for that person. And um, I'm calling this a personal barometer because it will help the client distinguish sexual arousal from sexual shame. And sexual shame can somehow uh, times be 
tied to arousal for recovering sex addicts and um, also discover their own sexual truth. I think while working with this workbook, people will start to find that there are things about their sex and sexuality that they didn't previously really know or they weren't able or willing to admit to themselves. So I call this the Katahakis Integrative Sex Therapy Model, also KIST, because KIST is sort of a clever uh, play on words when it comes to sex and sexuality. Um, but it is designed to support the practitioners to direct each client in co-tailoring a healthy, satisfying erotic life. And it aligns with five dimensions of the model, which are the physical, the emotional, the mental or psychological, the social, and the spiritual. And the intertwining of those dimensions lets the client's own bodily-based sense reveal which behaviors are or aren't appropriate for all aspects of his or her sexual self. So the choices that the client's making um, has to align with all five of those dimensions. It can't be off in one dimension. And that's the sort of litmus test for whether or not it's appropriate or inappropriate sexual behavior. Um, the workbook also gives the therapist specific questions to assist the client in differentiating sexual shame from toxic shame and trauma repetition. So there are three different chapters uh, where on the uh, chapter heading page, it directs the therapist to the appendix, which is in the back of the book. And the, there the therapist has more extensive information than the client does in the workbook, um, or it has instructions for how to ask appropriate questions that help to get closer to the kernel of the truth, um, or um, uh, there's a guided meditation also um, in one of the later chapters, and the, the therapist can take the client through that meditation by reading the meditation, literally, um, while the client has their eyes closed and they're imagining this process. So it's geared for both parties in um, a pretty clear way. And one of the things that I'm very excited about about this workbook is that it includes projective images for the client to color um, for homework and to expand upon by writing a story, memory, or poem that's to be processed in therapy. So every week there's homework. Um, these projective images were designed by my colleague, Terry Marks Tarlow, who is an expert in both you know, psychotherapy, clinical intuition, and nonlinear dynamic theory. And so you will see that these images are quite complex. They're very evocative. Um, everybody's going to have a feeling when they look at them. And then once the client starts to color them in, or you, if you're the client listening right now, um, something is going to emerge from that. And the act of coloring these images overrides that critical left brain idea of what's okay and what's not okay. And so I think you will both, uh, therapist and client, will find these projective images um, quite surprising and surprising in what they evoke. Um, you might be repulsed, you might be aroused and everything in between. Um, and then writing a story is also a right brain construct. What does this image evoke in you? And um, there are instructions that each one of these stories should have a beginning, a middle and an end so that it has a coherent narrative to it that reflects the image. And that processing of the image in the story because easily take one or two sessions. So with that, I want to remind both client and therapist that this is not a workbook that one is meant to blaze through. Um, I took great, great pains in making it highly intentional. It took me about a year to complete it, not because it was complicated. It was actually quite incredibly fun um, to discover this thing, but because I wanted to make sure that it made sense and that it flowed. Um, and I also knew that it would be activating to people, that it will be triggering to you both. Um, so you want to take time to honor the process of this emergent sexuality that's coming up as an adult, as opposed to the sort of rigid, reductive, and often destructive sexuality that was born out of um, your sex addiction. 
Uh, I also want to remind you that if you have any questions that um, or comments while I'm talking, that you can type them into the chat box and I can read them and answer your questions. If for some reason you want to ask a question anonymously, um, charlie at Center for Healthy Sex is where you should email those questions. And then Charlie will post them here so that I can see them. So the workbook also um, supports the client in defining as a self-agent, meaning it's up to the client to decide. The therapist is there as a steward, sort of as a fair witness, because they know your story. They've been through your recovery with you. Hopefully, they've been through a disclosure process with you. So if, if you're thinking that you know doing something would be okay for you again. The therapist is not going to shame you and say, you shouldn't do that again. Instead, they're going to say, you know what? Um, I remember that when you were acting out, that was a big part of your acting out. So let's talk about if that's appropriate right now, how that's going to fit into this sexual health plan, what it feels like for you when you think about actually doing this, what you imagine um, your partner might feel if you do it. So there's a lot of self-reflexive questions that will be asked of the client um, so that there is a critical thinking process and also a visceral feeling process that has you get honest with yourself. Um, and so we wanna be careful of, quote, the addict who can be very tricky or sneaky um, or baffling or cunning that's gonna come in and undermine your recovery. Um, so the idea is that this individualized sexual health plan um, is something that's joyous for you, that's excitatory, but it's also sustainable, that it sets you up for success, um, and that it aligns with your erotic um, template and your ethical values. So in the spring of 2017, I conducted a study at Center for Healthy Sex, um, and there were uh, six therapists, all of whom identified as sex addiction therapists. Four of them were CSATs, were certified sex addiction therapists. Two of them were not, but they had a way of working with sex addiction. And I followed the problem-solving action research tradition. Um, these sex addiction therapists treated at least four sex addiction clients per week, and they documented two weeks of sessions before they came in, and again, after the study. Um, they spent seven hours with me where I taught them this model, and then we went through some experiential work, and they completed a pretest about what their knowledge was and level of comfort with talking about a sexual health plan with people in recovery from sex addiction and a post-workshop self-assessment of their knowledge and confidence levels uh, for helping people with this matter. Um, they submitted two weeks of treatment logs after the study, and each participant reported insufficient previous sex therapy education in their sex addiction training. Now that has changed significantly um, in the ITAP certification program. Um, I've been teaching a two day long sex therapy workshop. Um, that's incorporated now in module three. And going forward, we will have uh, more sex therapy experts, uh, you know, training people more on sex therapy. Um, and then after the workshop, all people asserted that they had augmented their levels of knowledge, confidence, and frequency in initiating sex-centered conversations with their clients. So after the study, the two weeks following, all of them reported to me that they were bringing up sex therapy issues uh, much more often and that their clients were responding positively also. And they were tracking their clients' somatic cues and co-creating these sexual health plans. So these results strongly suggested that the KISS model provided <clears throat> a new paradigm for conveying sex therapy and, <clears throat> excuse me, for sex addiction clients having clear sexual health criteria. So one of the um, major cornerstones of this model comes from the World Health Organization. And you can find uh, this definition online by Googling World Health Organization. And what the WHO says is that sexual health is a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being. It's not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. So in our case, it's not merely the absence of the sex addiction behavior. Um, it's not enough to be sexually abstinent. We want people to be sexually healthy, to flourish, 
um, in their sexuality. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. For sexual health to be attained and maintained, the sexual rights of all persons must be protected and fulfilled. And this is a very inclusive definition that I think everybody can get on board with. So here you'll see the KIST model, which is recursive, it's um, uh, fractal, it's um, complex. It's a complex model because each aspect includes and transcends the previous. So the first place we start with is healthy sex. And erotic intelligence delineates pretty clearly what healthy sex is. It's an easy read for clients. It's kind of a beginning primer. Um, then we move into the physical aspect which also then um, the cognitive, meaning what is the person thinking about their sexual uh, sexuality? What are their ideas about it? So um, then we move into the affective. What are their feelings about it? Which can be more difficult for people who have struggled with dissociation their whole lives. So we wanna get people into their bodies um, to start to think about sex in a healthy way, but we also want them to feel into their bodies. And we want them to be concerned with what's happening interpersonally, what's happening between them and you as you talk about sex, to be able to explicitly say whether they are feeling shame or feeling aroused or um, confused about the relationship between the two of you because you're talking about sex and sexuality. There's an intimacy between therapist and client that arises, that should arise when you're in the realm of the erotic and the sexual. Um, and then finally, the spiritual, which includes and transcends the previous dimension. So we want this to be a complex model, a holistic model that includes all of these dimensions, not something that's just sort of reductive and simplistic. And the KIST model defines sexual health um, as any consensual sexual act with yourself or an adult or adults that you and your therapist agree is healthy based on how it impacts your physical, emotional, cognitive, interpersonal, intrapsychic, and spiritual well-being. So the reason I threw in the phrase, and your therapist, um, is because recovery is about being in consultation. Uh, Patrick Carnes talks about this a lot, that consultation is crucial uh, for lifelong recovery. None of us, whether we're in recovery or not, should make you know, important decisions in a vacuum. You know, there's a saying in AA that your mind is a dangerous neighborhood, so you shouldn't go in there alone. And I think that's true for all of us, that we can sort of confabulate things or tell ourselves that something's okay, and then we get into it and we think, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? So the idea here is that the person is in consultation with the therapist, with the sponsor, with trusted others, uh, and not making these decisions um, in isolation, because that's how the sex addiction or the sexually addictive behaviors were decided upon were in isolation. So these five dimensions, again, are the physical dimension, the affective dimension, the cognitive dimension, the interpersonal and intrapsychic dimension, and the spiritual dimension. So the workbook is broken up into these five areas. Um, and at the end of the workbook, again, called Spirit, uh, Sexual Reflections, um, there's a checklist for people so they can go through and check off that they have actually attained these very clear tasks of what they need in order to proceed in a sexually healthy way based on what they deem is, quote, healthy. So let's start with the physical dimensions. Um, the client discerns which sexual behaviors are harmful or exploitive to themselves or to another, and which add dignity and vitality to the self and are positive and pleasurable to the client and to the other. So you may have a client who's in recovery from sex addiction who says that a certain behavior is destructive for them. Um, or harmful to them. And you might think, wow, that doesn't seem that harmful to me. Maybe it's masturbation, which is absolutely um, a sex positive way of having a sexual pleasure with oneself. But if somebody was masturbating to the point of injury every day, if they were compulsive with internet pornography and masturbation was used in such a way that it had them not dating or had them not having sex with their partner, and they say, you know what, that's something I really wanna stay away from for now. 
it's not a lifelong sentence, then we as therapists have to honor what that person says is true for them and not have a judgment about it. Likewise, we shouldn't be imposing on people um, that that is problematic and they should never masturbate again. I mean, we are not the sex police and we're not arbiters of that. So we want this to be a collaborative situation. We want to really listen to what our clients say they want and need. Um, so we have a message here saying, adults with an S makes me wonder if all three or four, however many could all agree that all activities they do together are healthy. Um, I'm not sure what that means. The reason I said adults is because there are people who are polyamorous um, who are also in recovery from sex addiction. So, or people that want to have um, group sex, for example, or maybe a threesome with somebody. And that is not out of bounds for them in their program. Um, and so we want to be careful about saying, well, you know, sexual recovery is only for, you know, people that are monogamous and heterosexual and in a quote marriage. Um, I have a client or two that actually have not necessarily, I guess it's, you could sort of call it an open marriage, but they're very strict rules about you know, how often and when they bring a third person into their sex life. Um, and these people have stalwart recovery. They've been in program for a long time. That is not a bottom line behavior for this person. Um, and they've constructed a lot of uh, boundaries around this. And they, I have to say, have one of the healthiest marriages I've seen. So I don't want to um, constrict or define healthy sex as just two adults. And that's why um, I put the S in parentheses because it allows for a more broad-based definition of healthy sexuality. And if you've been paying attention, you'll see that we have an increasing amount of conversations and literature now about people being polyamorous and having open marriages. So um, you want to be um, curious about um, how people design their relationships and how that fits into their sexual recovery. Um, so the next point here says clients enjoy satisfactory physical responsiveness based on optimal functioning in the body, brain, mind. This includes being aware of his or her sexual response cycle. So there are questions about all of this. Does the person know their sexual response cycle? If not, why don't they? What do they need to do to figure that out? How can you help them start to better understand what they need? Because our sexual response cycle at 20 is very different than at 50. And the client understands his or her sexual body, their anatomy, their physiology. Um, if they're struggling with sexual desire or dysfunction issues, what are their needs they have around that in order to make sex more comfortable for them? And they've been tested for STIs um, and or other things that put them at risk. Where the affective dimension is concerned, um, the client doesn't feel guilty or shameful about sex and sexual behavior. Uh, they don't reenact previous trauma that includes dissociative feelings. So there's no loss of self. And um, this is really important when it comes to addictive sex versus healthy sex. Addictive sex can often be dissociative um, to the extreme. Um, and so we want healthy sex to be more associative, more present, more connected, no matter what the person is engaged in or doing. And the client can track and name the impulses in his or her body as feelings and can trust these impulses as a wholly individualized guide to what feels right and what feels wrong for them. So whatever their gut is telling them, whatever their chest is telling them, um, whatever you know, uh, impulses or activity they have in their extremities, that they're used to and conversant with the language of their body. Um, and then the client can communicate and receive communication about thoughts and feelings and possesses the potential for intimacy, vulnerability, and a long-term love relationship. So this might answer the question to Jessica, who says, well, what if one person in a couple thinks their behavior is okay, but the partner does not? And that um, is something sort of in the later chapters of this workbook. But um, what's important here, and remember, this, this workbook is designed specifically for the recovering addict because it was a research study and it's a thin slice. Um, it was not designed for the partner or the couple. It's, that's out of the purview of this book. The idea is that the recovering person gets super clear about what's true for them. They can communicate it to their partner and they can receive feedback about it um, without feeling defensive, 
um, and can hold on to themselves. And if the partner doesn't think that behavior is okay, then that is a couple therapy conversation and how people are going to negotiate those differences and desire, which would really be another webinar, I have to say, because that is a sex therapy issue um, of what about it is, you know, um, what doesn't the other person like? Why don't they like it? Do they not like it because they're afraid to stretch themselves sexually? Do they have a judgment about it? Do they have shame about it? Or does it flat out just take them out of their integrity and it would make them feel bad about themselves, therefore they can't do it? These are negotiations that happen in a relationship um, that are different than what I'm talking about right here. Um, and finally, in the affective dimension, and keep in mind, I'm giving you a very compressed version of uh, the Sexual Ref Reflections workbook because uh, we don't have time in an hour for me to actually go through a major training and teach people how to use it. But it is self-explanatory. And uh, my biggest recommendation, especially for therapists, is that you buy the book, you take yourself through it, you do the work in it so that you see what it evokes and how you would track your own feelings so that when you take someone else through it, you have uh, more empathy for what it might bring up for them and what it does um, to and with them. And then finally here, the client is willing and excited about sex um, and feels that pleasurable sexual acts restore a sense of dignity to them. Um, that's where we're headed, that sex is congruent with a person's integrity. It restores their dignity. It restores their vitality. Um, they feel happy during the day because they have um, a vital and um, pleasurable sex life, which doesn't mean that sex is always this kind of outrageous, you know, supercharged thing all the time. Sometimes it can be a very simple, very sweet connecting activity. Sometimes it can be, you know, highly erotic um, and intense and pleasurable in different ways. So the cognitive dimension helps the client relate to a lover with appropriate boundaries. Um, so specifically, the client knows when to say no. They can hear no from another. They don't violate his or her dignity or body by engaging in unwanted sexual experiences, which both um, addicts and partners report doing all the time. Um, and it does not take sexual advantage of another through physical or psychological manipulation. So again, this is about being congruent and in integrity. So you can see where just that paragraph could take a number of weeks or months to work through with somebody. Um, so they start to have a more um, adult kind of sexuality where they may say, you know, I like having sex in a particular way. And their partner says that particular way reenacts my trauma and I can never have sex that way. Then we have to have a conversation again in a couples forum uh, where both parties are dealing with their grief and loss about not being able to do something. Um, but we can't ask our partners to violate their own integrity because there's something that we want or need. Um, sometimes we have to give those things up in relationship. Sometimes if what we want and need is so important to us, then we can't be in that relationship. So this process creates a dilemma for people. We have to look at what we truly value, who we value, um, what kind of life we want to have. And sometimes repairing a marriage from sex addiction is the best thing two people can do. And sometimes leaving the marriage is the best thing those two people can do. Either way, it's a painful road because we are forced to look at ourselves and what's true for ourselves. For the single client in this dimension, they create a dating plan um, or a sexual plan if they're in a relationship. So the dating plan in this book is an updated version of the dating plan in erotic intelligence. Um, and so this workbook is definitely also for people who are single in recovery. And finally, the client takes deliberate actions to set the stage for the kind of sexual experience he or she wants. Um, he or she is taking responsibility. Um, they're not passive aggressive. They're not hinting. Um, they're actually being explicit about what they want and what they like, and they can communicate it. So for the interpersonal or intrapsychic dynamic, the client reports comfortably talking uh, with their partner about a range of preferred sexual experiences, as well as disclosing their health status. So hopefully um, they've already talked about HIV status, um, any STIs they have, 
um, activity of a recovery from sex addiction, alcoholism, gambling, or other any other addictions that um, these conversations have been had. And by the time the person in recovery is talking about their sex life, they also have have a lot more self-compassion for them, their behaviors and their addiction, um, and significantly less shame about it because we don't want people spiraling into shame about their sex and sexuality. And the client reports comfort with a range of preferred sexual experiences, including masturbation, and they can freely discuss them with a partner, friend, potential love interest, certainly their therapist, uh, without shame. And so this, keep in mind, is aspirational. It's an exploration of, if I could imagine having any kind of sex I want to have, um, and I can do it without feeling shameful, what are the things that I think would be interesting to try or erotic to try or fun to try? And oftentimes when people, you know, can really get a hold of themselves and not judge the sexual act, but instead be willing to experience their own pleasure and give pleasure to their partner, they might try something that ends up being just completely hilarious and ridiculous. And you may end up laughing and thinking, well, that was sort of the weirdest or dumbest thing we've ever did. We probably won't do that again. Um, or it may surprise you and you might find out like, wow, that was really erotic and surprising. I didn't know that about myself. I didn't know that had I had that in me. Um, and I think people are often afraid of their sexual expression because we're worried about what it says about us. Uh, we make meaning about the sexual act. Um, animals don't make meaning about sexual acts. They just do it because they don't have a prefrontal cortex. It's all driven um, by their more primitive brains and bodies for the purposes of procreation. But human beings have sex for the purpose of pleasure now. It's no longer just about procreation. It's about a million different reasons. Um, and so why not experiment with your bodies the way you would experiment with anything else? Um, what gets in our way is our shame and what we think our partner is going to think about us or what we think about us. What does it say about me if I like that particular thing? What's my judgment about that? Um, what is my mother's voice in my head about that particular act? Um, what does my religion say about that act? Does that make me any less... Um, connected to God because I like physical pleasure in my body. These are the dilemmas that people have to grapple with. And it's our job as therapists to ask questions about that. Is the behavior itself shameful or are your ideas about this behavior shameful? Which is it? Um, and when we deconstruct it, where does that ultimately leave the client in terms of the choices that he or she wants to make? Um, the client reports an openness for the discovery of their personal truth uh, via the senses during sex. So sometimes, you know, we don't know what we like until we try it. Um, you might, you know, try a new exercise or a new yoga pose um, and you might hate it. But if you keep doing it over time, your body starts to adjust to it. And it's one of the best things you could have done for your back or your knees or your, you know, opening up your shoulders, perhaps. So suspending our judgment about things um, also helps us to wade into the waters of sexuality and also for partners, for each one of us to hold each other's heart with great care. You know, eye rolling judgments, shaming the other person by saying, well, you're just a, a sex addict and all you want is sex or saying to the partner, well, you're just, you know, frigid and you never like sex is incredibly shaming and anxiety. It's just blowing your anxiety through each other instead of being in a side by side position and saying, wow, we're both scared, we're both anxious, but we want to try this and we want to see what it feels like and we're going to talk about it afterwards with each other. That is incredibly healing and intimate and loving. Um, but judging each other about your sexual preferences is not loving. There's in fact nothing loving about that. It's actually um, very critical and it shuts everything down. And finally here, the client has a felt sense in their body that their sexual preferences and choices are congruent with his or her gender identity. So any questions here? Um, uh, good to see you, Alex. This is exciting to have this available. Thank you for creating this and thank you for the webinar. You are amazing. Thank you, Lisa. It's nice to hear from you also. Um, 
Lynn says, can you comment on the timing conversation that a single dating individual may have with another about sex addiction? Yes. Um, and so um, this is a very dicey thing. And here's the thing about sex addiction and recovery and partners and couples. It's all dicey because it is not a one size fits all proposition. And don't let anybody tell you that. This is about your unique sexuality, your heart, what's true for you. So if you're single and you're dating, um, and you think you want to be sexual with this person, sometime before you have sex with them is the time to have a conversation about birth control, SDIs, recovery from sex addiction, recovery from alcoholism. Um, you don't want to um, misinform somebody. Um, you also don't want to set yourself up for rejection or shame. So if I was dating somebody and I was starting to feel really attracted to them and I thought, you know what, this relationship's not going to go anywhere. I want to have casual sex with this person, which I think is perfectly normal and appropriate in recovery when per a person has enough recovery and a dating plan. So not just kind of willy nilly, but you've got some structure around it. I might say, you know what, I don't think I'm going to disclose my sex addiction to that person because I know that this is not going to go anywhere, but I want to have fun. I want to be sexual. I want to see what it feels like to be sexually sober with somebody where I'm not, you know, in, um, you know, this crazy love addiction fog about them, or I'm not drinking or something like that. If on the other hand, I thought that person was a potential for a relationship, then I think it's incumbent upon me to sit that person down and say, you know, our time together has been really fun and I really like you. And, you know, I just want to talk to you and tell you a little bit about my history, which is really hard for me. It's, I feel very vulnerable doing this right now. I'm scared if I tell you who I am, you won't want to be with me, but I'd rather tell you now than before we have sex. Um, and one of the things I want to tell you is this, maybe I have an STI and that's when I would, I might start with that. And then I might also tell them a little bit about my history and my childhood that, you know, when I was a child, X, Y, and Z happened in my family without getting into like the whole detailed story. Um, and I became very promiscuous as a teenager and in college. And in my twenties, I realized that I was a sex and love addict and that's what this means. And this is what I've done over the years to rectify that. But I go to meetings and they're 12 step meetings and they're like AA and, you know, so I would give it a light touch, but I would be honest about it. So that was kind of a long winded um, answer to the question, but I hope that answers your question for you. So use your good judgment. Don't, you know, you don't want it to be TMI. Certainly don't do it on the first date because the person won't want to see you again. It's just way too inf much information. Um, so do it um, judiciously. Um, someone asked, do you differentiate addiction from trauma? Um, and I would say yes and no. Um, first of all, yes, clinically for certain. Um, but for the purposes of talking to somebody about dating, I might set up the trauma so that they have a context for which I began acting out sexually. So they don't just think that this sex addiction just kind of, you know, spontaneously combusted or that I'm someone who's super promiscuous and I'm just using sex addiction as an excuse, which, you know, we hear in popular culture all the time. I would want to give the person a little bit of context for how I was hurt um, and how it manifested in me seeking love in all the wrong places or using sex as a way to find love. And as such, I might even be careful as the about the word addiction if I was afraid it was going to scare somebody off. But I may tell them that I go to 12-step meetings. And if they queried further, then I would let them know what that was. All right, so in the spiritual dimension, and this is a little bit more nebulous, but this is when people start to move towards um, sometimes after, and I delineated this in erotic intelligence, where there's healthy sex, um, intimate sex, which I've been talking about, the erotic realm where we're starting to experiment because we trust each other again. And ultimately, sex is a spiritual 
um, practice or possibility because I think in long-term committed relationships, we have to keep infusing novelty into the relationship. And role play and sex toys and those kind of things are great for the novelty, but without a real heartfelt spiritual connection, that can start to feel flat and objectifying again. Um, and then this, of course, is just my opinion. Somebody else might have a different opinion or experience. So in this dimension, the client has made a conscious choice about spiritual or, or, spiritual or religious preferences. Um, and this would include if they're agnostic or atheistic, but um, they, have, they have come to a choice about their spiritual or non-spiritual self. Um, and they've done it through a 12-step program, through conversations with a teacher, a mentor, a therapist, and they can discuss these choices with their therapist and with their partner and how that aligns with their sexuality. Because I think our sexuality and our spirituality are intertwined. I don't think we can separate the two from each other. Um, even if there is um, an atheistic perspective that there is no higher power, there is no God, then my spirituality, my sexuality is really going to be more bodily based is how I would imagine that. And so I think that would be really important to communicate to somebody if they say, well, I've had altered states of um, experiences in sex. And I feel like, you know, I've had these divine experiences during sex through breath work. And I'm really interested in these kind of um, sort of higher states that come from some of these neo-tantric practices, um, somebody else may be into that or not into that. So you kind of want to, you know, see if those things align. And, and these are fundamental values that you want to um, see if uh, you're in alignment with, with a person when you get in relationship with them. Um, and as such, I think that people who restore their marriages um, in recovery from sex addiction do so when they share the same values. Um, people often will say, well, I really love my partner, um, but love is not going to take people the distance in repairing um, marriages that are destroyed from sex addiction. Values do. Um, and that's really where I think people have to um, make some tough decisions. Um, and in this case also, spiritual and religious beliefs add to the sexual experience in positive ways. Um, the client doesn't experience sexual shame or guilt due to spiritual or religious beliefs. Um, and that is often the case with many people. I was just uh, conducted a panel at the IPTAP symposium and two of the women on the panel were daughters of pastors. And they um, had this unbelievable um, bind that they were in because on the one hand, you know, they grew up with this religiosity and on the other hand, uh, their fathers were sexually addicted and that led them to become sex addicts also. That wasn't the only reason, but that was a big component of it. And so both of those people had to, in their healing, restore their spirituality to something that felt right to them. And so there's no room in healthy sex um, for spirituality or spiritual or religious beliefs to be creating shame. And this is another point in the workbook where you might, you know, have to hit the pause button and help a person through that sort of religious poisoning, as I think Marianne Williams calls it, um, where, you know, we, we just can't have those negative guilt and shame thoughts um, in the bedroom with us because um, it will kill our arousal. Um, it will kill sex altogether. And the client also remains fluid during sex. They can make a meaningful connection between the spiritual and the sexual, and they can choose to process their spiritual sexual experiences with others to understand or deepen their spiritual or sexual life. And there are tons of books written about sex as a spiritual experience. As I said before, there are tantric practices that lead to this. So these are kind of later stage recovery um, propositions for people to start to expand their spirituality or their sexuality into something that's good and true and beautiful and life affirming as opposed to dour, shaming and destructive. So this workbook also relies on the psychobiological approach to sex addiction treatment. Um, there's a guide in the book for the client and the therapist. I'm not going to be able to go through this guide with you today because we don't have enough time. But the, as I said to you before, the client's going to be asked to notice the sensations and the emotions in their bodies. And they're going to reflect on this in various worksheets that are in the workbook. 
Um, and also there's an activation scale at the end of every section where the client's going to be asked to scale their uh, somatic um, feeling. So we're helping people, helping you, the client, get in touch with your body, noticing where these impulses are um, so you can start to locate them and feel into the body. And the activation scale will look something like this, you know, on a scale of one to 10, one being no activation and 10 being maximum activation. Where do you, how activated do you feel about this conversation about, you know, telling somebody that you're a sex addict? And you might reply by saying, you know, right now I feel like I'm at a seven and as a therapist, I would say, well, where do you notice that seven in your body? And you might say, oh, it's in my gut. I feel sick to my stomach. Um, and so there's a whole protocol for the therapist to help you start to work with what is that sick to my stomach feeling saying? Because I would render that that shame, that shame about myself. So we want to move you and therapists, we want to move the clients down to around a maybe one or two where the client starts to have compassion for themselves and say, you know what? I became a sex addict for good reason. Um, I was traumatized. I was hurt. This was my coping mechanism. And so it's okay that this is a part of who I am. This is the tapestry of my psyche and my personality. And I don't have shame about it. I am grateful because I'm in recovery. I'm changing my life. I'm moving towards health. And if somebody doesn't want me because I have this, um, you know, had this trauma and it acted it out this way, then the truth is I don't want to be with that person. You want to be with somebody who's compassionate and forgiving, not someone who's going to create more shame for you. Um, there's a somatic note sheet where you'll be asked to uh, make notes um, around, you know, the face, the tone of voice, the body, um, things like that, which will help people start to locate where these impulses are in the body as well. Um, I talked about the projective images where we're going to ask people to color in to evoke their imagination and intuition. And reconstructing the past by using imagination can um, have the client learning a whole lot more about themselves and their sexuality and really where they get stuck or scared. Um, and I went over this before that there are instructions on how to write the story um, and how that's processed in the next therapy session. So there are 10 basic components to the psychobiological approach uh, to sex addiction treatment, which I'm not going to go over in detail again because we don't have time. Um, but I will tell you that they're um, in the workbook and um, they are very explicitly laid out. Um, it's shorter for the client because some of the things that therapists do don't may not make sense or you may not even care about. But the uh, guide in the back of the book for the, uh, the therapist, the appendix, um, of the Passat guide is explicit and um, I think will be enormously helpful for you. So I don't at the moment see if we have any other questions. Is anybody thinking anything, feeling anything, wondering anything? Um, I do want to remind you that Sexual Reflections is available on Amazon right now at amazon.com. Um, I think it's important, again, for this to be done in a therapeutic setting uh, because it really does need to be processed in a step-by-step -step way. Charlie just posted the link to the workbook um, on the um, site here. And um, Kathy says her copy will be arriving on Tuesday. So for those of you that are therapists, please, at the very least, um, make sure that you um, you know, read this, take yourself through it so you're familiar with it. Um, Dee says the cover is very different. The cover photo is different from the inner photos. Can you explain? And I would say, yes, all of the inner photos are very different from each other. That is by design because these are meant to be, um, um, uh, perceptive tests. They're, they're meant to be, um, I just lost my train of thought, sorry. Uh, they're projective images. That's why they're all different. Um, so in most books that you would have a style of art and that style would be throughout the workbook. But keep in mind that the same artist drew um, the, um, the, the drawings. So it's one artist throughout the book, but they are distinctly different by design so that they become evocative. Um, someone said, I just ordered, is there a separate therapist guide? No, the therapist guide is in the appendix and it's in the book. So there's one workbook, but the therapist appendix is in the back of the book. And at the beginning of every chapter um, where it's the therapist needs to um, reference the appendix, it tells you, therapist, please see this these pages in the appendix. 
Um, Tom says, you said that values could move a relationship, not love. Would you explain? I didn't say that. I said that I think the people who stay together, who've suffered a betrayal, whether it's a single incident affair or massive destruction from sex addiction, stay together because they share similar values. A lot of times people will say, well, I really love this person. And I was saying that I don't think love is enough to get people through recovery from sex addiction. I think they must share the same values. What do they want in their lives? Where are they going? Um, do they share the same ideas about healthy sexuality, about how they're raising their children, about spirituality, about money? Um, sometimes people get together when they're very young um, and you know they wake up 20 years later and they're like, wow, I should never have married this person, which is never true because life is life. Um, but they might think, I really want to be with somebody who shares these things I'm interested in now and my partner's not interested. And so those are the things that separate people. Um, let's see. So Kathy says, I want to mention that the photos were showed here seem to be more female than male in nature. Is that true throughout the book? Um, no, the photos that you saw were Picasso's. The photos that you saw in my PowerPoint presentation today were Picasso paintings. They were all female because Picasso was obsessed with the female form. They were his erotica. I was at the Tate Modern in London and I took photos um, of those. And that's what I used in my PowerPoint presentation. I'm sure um, uh, Terry will be very flattered that you think her work was um, Picasso's work. The images in the workbook are not female. They are actually quite androgynous by design. They're vague by design. So I should have told you that at the beginning. I'm sorry you mistook uh, Picasso's images for the images in the workbook, but um, that's not what people will be drawing. Uh, so I'm glad that I'm glad you asked that question, and I'm glad um, we were able to clarify that here. Um, sorry about that confusion. Um, so any other questions, thoughts? All right. Well, I want to wish you all, um, especially women, especially those of you that are mothers, a very happy Mother's Day and happy spring. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing your questions and comments. Um, if you like the workbook or whatever your experiences of the workbook, if you would please uh, write a review on Amazon, I would appreciate it. And remember, you don't have to be a book reviewer. You can simply write one sentence, you know, great workbook was helpful to me, or this has helped my clients or whatever your experience is. But please don't be shy about writing those reviews and rating the workbook. It's very helpful to the book selling. Um, I won't be holding a formal training for this um, in the near future. Um, I will be holding a training. I just don't know when yet. And if you're on our mailing list, you'll definitely hear about it. Um, and I may even set something up in an online forum like this um, that makes it easy for people to attend as opposed to something in person. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you all for your support and for your attention. Um, and I hope you love well and that you experience your sexuality as healthy and happy. All right. Happy May. And I look forward to seeing you um, on my webinar for Mirror of Intimacy the first Monday of every month. Thank you.